Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. For more than 2,000 years, he's been doing all that he promised. Today, his church remains an assembly of his saints, providing a place for worship, fellowship, and instruction. In a world that often feels isolated and alone, church remains a place to connect. It's a place to call home. We're so glad you've chosen to connect with the family of believers at Campus Church in the Crown Center at Pensacola Christian College, as together we rejoice in the Lord. Take your Bibles, if you would, and join me in the book of Acts, chapter number two. Acts, chapter number two. There are a couple words that I think strike fear into the heart of maybe every parent When you're getting something and you take it home and then you see the words assembly required written on the box, it can be somewhat problematic. For the next couple of weeks, we're going to consider these two words as they pertain to the fellowship of the saints, the assembled body of Christ. We commonly refer to this as the church. So we're going to title this little mini-series assembly required, and then we'll go further, and that is understanding the fellowship of the saints. Why is it that this has such history and longevity, and and why is it that this, this living organization, the church, the body of Jesus Christ, why is it That this is the organization that, as we read at the end of Ephesians chapter 3, will be the means by which Jesus Christ is praised world without end. That this is not only for this time, for this age. There are certain aspects of the church that are only for this time. But the church is timeless from its birth, from its inception, All the way throughout all of eternity, it will be a relevant aspect of the worship of Jesus Christ. So how are we to look at this in a world that is rife with change? It's as if we're redefining everything. And it's almost as if we're open to the same. Well, let's question it and let's ask why is it that we've defined it as this way? Let's ask some questions about the church. Why is it relevant today? Why does it, I hate to use the words deserve, but why does it, why does it need to favor my attention? Because I've got a lot of things pulling for my attention. I only have a limited amount of time. I have other interests, other pursuits. That's a lot of commitment to come together and worship this this God of the universe. I I know he's God. I know he's worth it, but, but wow, I mean, is this something that I am going to remain committed to? We even come sometimes with maybe, I don't know, some expectations about uh, what did that do for me? Why should I pay attention, so to speak? Why not? And I'm being a little, I don't know, a little tongue-in-cheek or a little, a little um, maybe too obvious about this. But why should I come and even stay awake? Why should I give my attention to what is happening at this assembling of the saints? What's in it basically for me that is more valuable than a few moments of slumber? These are legitimate questions, and they're questions that, quite frankly, should be asked and then should be answered. So when we start to come to this title of assembly required, oh, wow, that means there's something expected on my part that I am not exactly sure I am invested in. J.R.R. Tolkien wrote the trilogy that that comes underneath the the Lord of the Rings, that opening novel. The Fellowship of the Ring is that which he began to unfold a plot and and some some assembling of people that were gathered. In fact, I I think there were nine people or, or nine who came together with this Fellowship of the Ring. 
And they were focused on something, and it's quite an epic journey that they embark upon. They're people from, from uh, I don't know, different groups. When Tolkien is writing about this, it's a, it's a fanciful novel. And so now he has these, these elves and, and uh, these hobbits and these humans and others that come together. They're not those that would typically, normally find themselves in a fellowship together. It's quite a diverse group. But they do so with one common goal in mind, and that is the destruction of a ring. And so the story unfolds, and certainly there are perils and adversaries and enemies all coming against this quest that they have embarked upon, the destruction of the ring. And three novels later, when, when finally their quest comes to its completion, so does the fellowship. Now, those who held this tight, so to speak, brotherhood because of the quest that was before them, now the fellowship is disbanded because they no longer share something in common. And so they go back to their own respective individual groups, no longer transcending the boundaries of those unique gatherings, now they are disbanded. They return to something that is their history, their normality. It's interesting that the church gathers around something that is never disbanded. It is something bigger than any human quest can ever offer. We will come together in life for all kinds of fellowships, and the greater, the more meaningful the purpose, the deeper and the more enduring the fellowship. The church has been assembling for more than 2,000 years. And our commitment to this assembly is essential. But if we don't understand why we assemble, we may question its value and even the necessity of the assembly itself. So let's take a look as we, as we roll back the tape of history at the beginning of this assembly and how did this all begin. Your Bibles are open right now to Acts chapter 2. We're going to, in a sense, cut to the chase. Look down at verse number 41 and then into verse number 42. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 and 42. Now, just before I read the text, the apostle Peter had been waiting for what Jesus promised. Jesus said, and ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. Wait for the power. Well, they're assembled together, these, these disciples, these followers, these apostles, and it's the day of Pentecost, and there was no doubting that what Jesus had promised had now come. We have what we need to be witnesses, and that they did. Jesus said, ye shall be witnesses when you receive power. They received the power and they did what they were told to do. They went and witnessed to the reality of Jesus Christ. As they did, Peter preaches this message of power, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, look at what happens. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse number 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. So in Acts chapter 2, we see what we're referring to as the establishment of the church. Now, these many years later, we are still assembling. We are carrying on something that was first initially passed to the apostles and then the apostles to the disciples and these disciples made more disciples and more and more. And now today, the church still assembles under that same authority when it first was birthed. As we assemble, what are we assembling around? 
Now, I know that we assemble around the person of Jesus Christ, but let's drill down on this a little bit further and let's see why does the church, or what do we share in common around what do we share fellowship today in the church? The first thing we're going to look at is what we'll refer to as the fellowship of the gospel. The fellowship of the gospel. Now that may sound rather straightforward, but let's look into this a little bit further. The fellowship of the gospel. Look again at verse number 41, you see this phrase. Then they that gladly received his word. So what word is it exactly that they gladly received? So let's back up in the passage again. So you're still in Acts chapter 2. Look back at verse number 22. Acts chapter 2. Let's look beginning at verse number 22. Here the Bible records this for us. Peter was preaching and he says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. He's saying, listen, you all know this already. Verse 23, him, Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Do you know what the apostle Peter is sharing We have now this early account, this historical account. He's just repeating something that actually happened at a real point in time in history. This isn't just some like, well, hey, I've come up with a philosophy. No, 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 no. He's recounting something that actually took place. There was a real Jesus who was birthed. He lived a sinless, spotless life. He was taken unjustly at the hands of wicked men, falsely accused, crucified, buried, and risen again. And do you know what this constitutes? This constitutes what we refer to as like, wow, I I see that happen, but you know, that's actually good news because what Jesus did was on my behalf. I'm the one who was supposed to die and Jesus died in my stead. He died for me. This is good news because I have the sentence of death upon me and Jesus took that sentence. The the gavel came down by by the hand of a just judge saying, guilty am I? And Jesus said, yes, but let me take his punishment. I'll stand in his stead. And so Jesus died a sinner's death so sinners can live through Jesus' life. It's the most wonderful news that's ever been given to mankind. That is the gospel. The Apostle Paul refers to this. In fact, in Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, listen to the fellowship he talks about. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for what purpose? He says, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. That word fellowship, it's the word koinonia. You've probably heard the word before. It means, hey, this is what we share in common. Remember, the deeper, the more meaningful, the more significant the thing we share in common, the deeper our fellowship, the more enduring, the more long lasting. And Paul said, hey, we share something in common. We have the fellowship of the gospel. To put it simply, the word fellowship just means we are sharing something together. We all have this. Every believer in the church has the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ in common. Okay, C.S. Lewis once explained some things in in his book titled The Four Loves. C.S. Lewis explains something about how it is that we share things in common. And he said it this way. He said, lovers are normally face to face absorbed in each other. Friends, side by side, absorbed in some common interest. Do you know what churches share together in common? Something far more meaningful than than something like a sport. I, I find it interesting that we gravitate towards those that we share something in common with. Things like football, or music, or art, movies, um, um, your, your, your areas of study, children, 
Whatever we share in common with others, it provides us some means of fellowship. But we are not called as believers to the fellowship. Now, please understand and please hear this carefully. It is vitally important when we understand assembly required. We are not called to the fellowship of the dress code. We're not called to the fellowship of the music. We are not called to the fellowship of the worship style. And while I'm not saying that these things are unimportant, they are not most important. Let me say that again. While we are not saying that these things are unimportant, we are saying that they are not most important. Interestingly enough, there are basically two things that cause what we refer to commonly as friction. What is it that causes friction? Well, number one, one object is moving and the other is not. So if, if one object is moving and the other is not, if I, if I stand here and I just even rub my hand against the front of the pulpit, there is friction because one object is moving and the other is not. So that's one aspect that, that causes in any different dynamic what we refer to as friction. The other thing that causes even greater friction is when two objects are moving in the opposite direction. Wow, one is moving one way and another the other. Now we have, we have even greater, more intense sense of friction. And isn't it interesting when, when two walk together, Oh, wow, there's something that happens that is this dynamic of fellowship. Now, we are in common unity, moving toward some common object, some common goal, some shared purpose. But even in the church, when, when one is moving and the others are not, or when one is moving and, and someone else is moving in the opposite direction, ooh, now we start to have this sense of friction, has anyone here ever experienced friction? A church split, now please don't raise your hands. But sometimes we almost with some, some aspect of, oh yeah, that's what churches do, churches split. Well, well, not his church. His church, the church of Jesus Christ is this unified body. His robe, the robe of Christ was not rent no bones in his body were broken. There is a unified aspect of the body of Christ that's essential today, just as it was in the day of Jesus. So what is it that oftentimes causes friction? Have you ever been, again, don't raise your hand, but have you ever been in a church that may have actually had friction? God forbid, a church that may have split over something as trivial as the color of carpet. Is that possible? Is it possible that the, the, the human picture, the earthly picture of the unified body of Christ, the church, could split over something as, as trivial as human preference? Sometimes churches find it challenging when, when there is a disagreement regarding should the church have pews or chairs or the frequency of their worship or are the songs projected on a screen? Or are they only held in a hand? Or ties are worn or ties are not? Or a whole host of what we sometimes refer to as secondary issues. Certainly churches can and I think are invited to take positions on any of these things. But should we expect that churches would agree primarily on anything less than those first issues, which I would submit to you is the gospel. Again, I'm not saying that secondary issues are unimportant. What I am saying is that they are secondary issues. I find it instructive that the Apostle Paul spent much, much time addressing the primary issues far more than he did the secondary ones. And it's not that the secondary issues in Scripture are not mentioned, they are. So let me again reiterate, I'm not saying that secondary issues are not important. I'm just saying that that's what they are, secondary. One man wrote the following. He said, most Christians speak kindly and calmly about their convictions, but sadly, it often feels like the less important the issue, the more intensely someone will hold to it. 
I believe that the more mature the believer, the more strongly he can hold to his secondary issues without requiring that everyone do the same. He can even participate in congregational worship where the church as a whole wouldn't hold to the same practices as would he, but he does so with grace that's befitting the mature child of God. There are many that hold strong positions on dress or homeschooling or Christmas trees for that matter. And when they hold to these positions graciously, without requiring that everyone else do the same, they demonstrate an understanding of where our fellowship truly begins, where it must find its first foundation, and that is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. When we start to say, well, where do we summarize the good news? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4 Here, Paul gives us this really clear understanding of what is the good news. That's what the word gospel means, good news. What is it? Well, we look at it and he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you, we're going to know exactly what's coming, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. And here it is, the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins. Did you get that? This is the good news. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What Paul is saying is I have good news for you. And this good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and rose again the third day, just like the scripture said, this is for us today. Why is this such good news? Because all of us have gone our own way. All of us are, by our own actions, separated from the holiness of God. And if that separation from God is never resolved, the consequences are tragic. Have you ever read some excerpts from sermons of days gone by? Wow, when you start reading some of the history of preachers from what we sometimes say was back in the day, wow, did they help us understand the just wrath of a holy God. Some of us could probably, if we said, hey, tell me the name of one of those historic sermons where the holiness of God was trumpeted. We might say, oh, Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God. And then we read from excerpts of this powerful sermon, things like God is under no obligation to keep sinful man a moment from eternal destruction. The wrath of God burns against them. Their damnation does not slumber. The pit is prepared. The fire is made ready. The furnace is now hot, ready to receive them. The flames do now rage and glow. The glittering sword is wetted and held over them, and the pit hath opened its mouth under them. It's reported that when Jonathan Edwards preaches this sermon, there were th- this sermon, there were those that came and with weeping and wailing before God, dear God, forgive me. And you say, well, th- this is tragic news. No, what this tragic news does is it highlights the beauty of the good news. Like, whoa, man, God, God is an angry God. Oh, God is angry against sin and the destruction it brings. But God is a loving God who opens the treasure house of heaven for all who will come. What is it that makes the gospel such good news? I'm apart from Jesus Christ. I am in very bad condition. My future is doomed apart from Jesus Christ. This seems to be the message that we see all throughout Scripture. Think through what it was that Isaiah says in Isaiah 63, 3 and 4. For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury. Their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart. The year of my redeemed is come. Wow. It sounds like the wrath of God is a real thing. Yes, it is. We go on and we read in the New Testament things like Ephesians 5, 6, let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God 
upon the children of disobedience. We read in the book of Revelation 14.10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup. There's no diluting of this. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Revelation 15.1, I saw another sign in heaven and great and marvelous seven angels having the seven plagues for in them is filled up the wrath of God. It's as if it can contain no longer and this wrath is poured out upon the children of disobedience. Revelation 16.1, and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. John 3.36, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, good news. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The Apostle Paul has such a compelling burden that the lost would come to know the beauty and the blessing of the gospel message. Why is the gospel such beautiful news? Because it is contrasted against the terrible news of the wrath of God. You know, if you and I don't understand how, how desperate a situation we're in, we'll never really appreciate the beautiful situation we've been transferred into because of the loving hand of a gracious God. And notice what the Apostle Paul says of the fellowship that exists between the church at Philippi. Philippians 1.5 for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. You know, we share something wonderful. That is the fellowship of the gospel. L let me basically summarize the last two aspects of that fellowship that we share. We not only have the fellowship of the gospel, but because this is such a, a wonderful fellowship, I, I don't know that there's anything greater than what we have, the good news of Jesus Christ. Because of the fellowship of the gospel, we also understand the priority of the fight for the gospel. There are things worth fighting for today, and the gospel stands as that which you and I must contend for in Philippians 1.7, he says, the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. Then in verse number 17, he says, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. To defend, it just means to protect, to guard, to fight on behalf of. The Greek word used for defense is apologia. It's an interesting word. When we start to think about the word, it's the word we get apologetics from. When we refer to apologetics, we mean a reasonable defense of the scriptures. Ah, how, how can I stand in defense of? And the apostle Paul said, I'm going to be ready to have this defense of the gospel. It's the same word Paul uses to defend himself in a riot at Jerusalem. Men, brethren, fathers, hear ye my apologetic, my apologia, my defense, which I now make unto you. And he goes on and he shares his personal testimony and the power of the gospel that changed his life. The word confirmation that's used there just means guarantee, my, def my confirmation, my defense. Listen, the gospel, this is the guarantee that God has given to people just like you and me. You and I ought to be ready to not only gather around the fellowship of the gospel, there are some things worth fighting for. The gospel, certainly, we stand in defense. I will fight for the gospel. And then as we, as we come to some rapid conclusion, we understand not only our fellowship of the gospel, the fight for the gospel, but you and I share something that we now have the opportunity to be involved in the furtherance of the gospel, the advancement of this good news. Again, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, he says, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Do you know when we have spent time in the book of Romans, We've understood that there are, no, there are no unnecessary components of the plan that God unfolds before us. We know that all things have the potential in our lives. We can see the hand of God. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. 
For whom he did foreknow, he also did foreordain to be conformed to the image of his son. He's saying, listen, there are no random things in your life. Even those hurtful things, those things that, that others may have intended for evil, God says, no, 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 I'm going to take their evil intention and I'm going to turn that around and intend it for your good. And the Apostle Paul understands that the things which have happened to him, he's writing to the church at Philippi while he is in chains in Rome. Do you know, he says, the things that happened to me have happened for a reason. They have happened for the furtherance, the advancement of the gospel. What are you enduring right now? God, I wish this wasn't a part of my life. I, I wish this wasn't a part of my story. I, I wish this chapter was not unfolding right now before me. I mean, I turn another page and there's challenge, there's difficulty, there's sickness, there's heartache, there's loss. Lord, there's trouble. I'm perplexed, I'm dismayed, I am hurt, I am broken. And God says, don't miss the fact that these things have befallen. They've happened unto you. And if you'll see something bigger than the circumstance, you'll actually see the advancement of the greatest treasure that we've been given, the good news of Jesus Christ. This is for the furtherance of the gospel. Don't allow things to distract you from the advancement of it. You know, sometimes we even think, oh, well, there are some things that are really, you know, distracting the furtherance of the gospel. They're hindering it. Things like my sinful past. Oh, if you knew my past, if, I just don't know that God can use a person like me. Sadly, some people are not set on the furtherance of the gospel because they still are mourning over their sinful past. Take your past and use it a part of, as a part of your living apologia, your living apologetic. Listen, if God can take a person like me who has this and this and this, the apostle Paul says, listen, if you want to talk about sinners, sign me up as the chief. I actually persecuted the church of God. And he says, but you know, God be thanked. If he can use a person like me, Paul's saying, can't he use a person like us? Sometimes our wasteful present is a hindrance to the gospel. Sometimes we're not set because we focus so often on that which doesn't matter. Have you ever used the expression, where's the time gone? So often it slips away from us and we have nothing to show for it. Well, we don't oftentimes use this prefix anymore. We used to hear it said often. We all know it, but we don't use the prefix as often. If you're going to connect to anything on the internet, you use an address, and that address begins with www dot whatever. And we all know the www, the worldwide, and it is appropriately titled. Because how often have we been caught in the web of distraction? How many times do we whittle away precious moments and we look back and have not so much to show for it? I am not, I am not begrudging the value. I am not trying to, to, to in some way, shape, or form stain the, the usefulness of the internet. But anything that God gives us that can be used for good, we also know the enemy tries to take and use it for some ill gain or ill purpose. How often do we find ourselves immersed in something that really has no value? And sometimes not only does it have no value or vain, empty, but oftentimes it's destructive. It's actually taken our focus off from the one who ought always be in some way, shape, and form in view. And, and it puts in view that which is so distant from him. Scripture challenges us in Colossians 4, 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are without. And then he says, redeeming the time. He says, listen, walk, because there are people outside that you and I have to engage. So, so let's walk in wisdom. Let's use our days, our moments, our times wisely, and especially towards them that are without. Our desire is to see them within. Each of us, Share the fellowship of the gospel. We should use whatever circumstances God places us in to fight for the gospel. And we should understand that there are no lost circumstances that can't be used for the furtherance of the gospel. John Bunyan's preaching was so powerful that the leaders of the Church of England jailed 
put him in jail, the Bedford County Jail. They, they, they jail him in an attempt to silence his voice. Refusing to be silent, Bunyan continues to preach in the jail courtyard. He has a large audience now of prisoners that come to hear him. And when others from the area find out that Bunyan is preaching, they come and they gather outside the jail. And now crowds are coming daily to line the outside of the jail, listening to Bunyan preach the word. They say, we can't have this. And so now they take John Bunyan and they lock him in the innermost part of the prison where he can have no voice for the prisoners. No word for those gathering outside the prison walls. And maybe it was there that his voice speaks the loudest. And it is there in, in the cell, in his own confinement, that he begins to pen the, the, the book that, quite frankly, has been translated more often than any other book aside from the Bible. And that is the book Pilgrim's Progress, whose influence not only... Uh, uh, reach to the, 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 the several that were inside the courtyard or maybe the hundreds that were beyond the courtyard, but tens of millions of people are influenced with the furtherance of the gospel because there was someone who said, these things have befallen me for the furtherance of the gospel. What setting does God have you in today? I submit that your circumstances cannot quench the furtherance of the gospel. In fact, they may be the very thing God is using for its advancement. Campus Church, may the primary method of sharing the gospel message be you and I delivering the news that Jesus came to seek and to save those that are lost. That he was buried and that he rose again the third day for the remission of sin. Our fellowship is bound together in the gospel. It is the center of our spiritual universe. It is the very heart of our existence. It is so central to our very existence that we must be prepared to fight and preserve and protect it. And because it is so essential, our sustenance, our very life, may we find ways to further it. Sharing the message of Christ's finished work for all who will receive it. And along the way, may we understand that to advance the gospel, he has called his body to first assemble. We're glad you joined us for Rejoice in the Lord as we've discovered answers to life's questions from God's Word. Messages are also available on iTunes when you search Rejoice TV or find us on YouTube by searching Rejoice in the Lord. Your financial support is vital to keep Rejoice on the air. Your tax-deductible gift enables this viewer-supported ministry to spread the gospel around the world. Encouraging Christians and reaching people for Jesus, this is Rejoice in the Lord. I'm so glad you've joined us today for Rejoice in the Lord. Many of you watch faithfully each week as we study the Word of God and sing praises to the Lord. You know, music has been a vital part of the Rejoice telecast over the last 40 years. And I'm happy to tell you that again this year, we've compiled several songs that you may have heard and enjoyed on Rejoice over the past several months. We call this compilation 2022's Best Musical Moments. For your gift of $70 or more to Rejoice, we'll send you the DVD and companion CD of 2022's Best Musical Moments. You'll enjoy the musical ministry of our Rejoice musicians as you watch or listen. And most importantly, your gift will help keep Rejoice in the Lord on the air. Call, write, or go online today and request 2022's Best Musical Moments.